Okay, so now that we have the tile, let's create the grid. This will feel very similar to other tutorials. So I'm just gonna go straight ahead. A grid is a two-dimensional array of tiles. The number of tiles is given by the number of dimensions at index zero. And we're gonna make as many of those lists as necessary, as many as we specified in dimensions at index one. It represents a two-dimensional array of tiles. The grid starts empty. And our purpose is to populate it using procedural programming. For every row in a range of values that goes from zero to index at position one, the number of rows, we create one empty row. For every column in a range of values that goes from zero to the total number of columns at dimensions at index zero, we first generate a new tile that is gonna receive the position C and R, and then we append it to the row. We say row.append and we place the tile. Once we're done, we append to the grid. We append the row. That's it. Now we have a grid. The same grid that we used right here in line 100 all the way down to line 106. You can see it right here. Let's run this program and let's see if we get any errors. Good. No errors. The program runs and halts almost immediately. Now that the hardest part of our program is done, which is modeling the data, we can finally move into the coding section. Although here we jump into a gray area, I often like to think about what we just did as part of the data definitions. So here is where we finally implement the algorithm. We start simple. We take one of the elements in the grid, which is a tile in the system, and we collapse it we can ask it to now take an identity. Remember, this process is random. It can take any potential tile that it wants. Then we create a draw function that is gonna take the surface that we created and it's gonna change its background color. Let's pick this color right here. If our program and our grid is produced properly, we shouldn't see any background color at all because every pixel will be covered by our tiles. Here we need to use our template. Our grid is a compound data type of type list. So we use a for loop for every row in the grid. We do whatever we want to do, but we do it to a row. A row is also a list. So we also use a for loop to iterate over every single tile inside of that row. And for each of those, we do whatever we want, but we do it to a tile. I'm gonna copy the template and you'll see, we're gonna use it quite a lot. I'm gonna fix the indentations, get rid of the comments, and here we are. So this part I am not gonna use in this implementation. This one is, this one is a reference to my template for when I need to use higher order functions. But in this case, I don't need to. So the first thing I'm gonna do in my algorithm is to update my neighbors. So I can say tile.update neighbors. And we add the brackets. The function update neighbors is in charge of evaluating which neighbors we have if they are collapsed and if they are to assign their sockets. Once I am done assigning the neighbors, it's time to calculate the lowest entropy, this time a global parameter, that starts at none. Not zero, but none, because if I use zero, then no matter what value of entropy the lowest tile has, it will never be smaller than zero. And I repeat the process. I paste my template, add indentations, fix them, I don't need this again. And now, if the tile is not collapsed, if the tile is not collapsed, otherwise it doesn't make sense to evaluate the entropy, then I can set the lowest entropy, which is the return of the method of the entropy of the tile, to be equal to the tile.update entropy. 
And to this function, remember, let's see the template, I need to pass the lowest entropy. So let's pass it over here. So lowest entropy enters, lowest entropy exits with the old or an updated smaller version. Lowest entropy will calculate also which are the new potential tiles that this tile can take based on the number of neighbors. Once we are done, we can get a list of candidates. A list of candidates represents those tiles that will enter the next round when picking the next tiles to collapse. I paste the template once more, get rid of the comments, fix the indentations. Here I can ask again, if the tile dot, if the tile is not collapse and the tiles entropy is also equal to the lowest entropy, it means that this is a candidate. So I add this tile to the list of candidates. And finally, I need to ask, if there is at least one candidate in the list of candidates, it's time to collapse another tile. So I take the list of candidates and here I can pick at random. I can pick the last element in the list. I can pick the first element in the list and it will yield a slightly different result. But for now, I'm just gonna take the first element in that list and I'm gonna collapse it. And the program is done. Notice how once we establish the helper functions that we required, processing it was extremely simple. And here, one of the important things is that draw function should only be in charge of rendering images. So actually what I'm gonna do is to put this piece of code into a second function called update. And here I'm gonna repeat the process of going through my two-dimensional grid using the templates. And what I'm gonna do is to call the draw function. Once I'm finished, I'm gonna ask for the handshake that Pygame does with another programming language, which is the one that actually renders the screens which is one of the family of C languages. Now we have a draw and an update function. So let's run this using an infinite loop and let's see what happens. Forever, draw, and update. Let's run this and let's see what we get. Excellent, the algorithm works. But there is a tiny little bit of a problem. If I click on the window and I try to move it around to show it to my friends, the function collapse collapses. And the reason why this happens is because our window is not interactive. To make it interactive, we need to add a small addendum to our update function. We say that for every event in the list of events of Pygame, if the event is of type quit, which is a constant parameter that the Pygame library has, that is represented as the boolean of whether or not we are closing the window, we exit Pygame. This has the nice side effect of making our windows interactive. And this time I can just move the tiles around. Now this tile set is quite interesting, I really like it but I have another one that you are also going to find in the GitHub page that is attached to this video tutorial. Let me close it and let me show it to you. You may have wondered why the name of the tiles folder was tiles2 and it is because it was the second example that I prepared for this demo. However, there is a previous generation called tiles1 or simply tiles that look like this. They are tiles uh, inspired from an RPG tile set that I found online. So I separated them into their different components and used the same principles that dictated the previous uh, implementation. So now that I have it, in theory, if I change these from tiles to, to tiles, and knowing that the metadata file is located within the tile section, let me show it to you, it's right there. If I run the program, I would expect to see the updating of this procedural world. 
I'm going to leave it running for a bit and I'll show you the final result. And here it is. A good example on procedural land mass generation. Let's think a bit about uh, how we can export this information and use it somewhere else. Each of your tiles preserves the metadata that it inherited. That means that you can traverse the two-dimensional array and export the identity of each of your new tiles in the form of a TXT document that you can read in other programming languages or engines and use it to extend this algorithm to a quote-unquote three-dimensional landscape. But besides that, you can also assign special attributes to each of your tiles. Like, for example, everything that is ground could be considered to be a path where the character can move. These are things that I recommend you, however, not to do in Python anymore. I recommend you to jump ahead and save the metadata somewhere and process it somewhere else.